One thing I've been thinking about today, right, and I wanted to kind of speak about, randomly popped in my head, is I was thinking, will you still be watching DJ live streams, if you have been anyway, during, um, you know, the ones you've been watching during lockdown? Would you consider, would you continue watching them once you've, you know, wherever you live has opened up and you're able to go back to the quasi real world and you're able to kind of go to an actual club? Will you continue watching live DJ live streams? I'm a little bit in between i'm not too sure again i'm in a unique position because i can kind of see it from the perspective of a dj having you know done it for a number of years at a very low level don't get me wrong bars and pubs around my area but still it's something to hold on to it's something um i can see it from that side and i can also see it from a punter having done my fair bit of techno tourism so i would say as an artist or as a dj i would be a little bit annoyed if i was playing somewhere in a club and I was told that my set would be recorded because even for myself, and I've recorded a few sets at Pirate Studios, Big Up Pirate, and they have a, these amazing self-contained studios that you can basically hire per hour um, with you know up-to-date equipment that you will use in the club. So it's a great place to go and practice or to go and record the DJ mix. Um, I've done plenty of live streams on there that I pre-recorded some that I've done live. It's really a great resource. Um, <clears throat> and like I say, for my own self, having spent some time in Pirate Studios recording, it really does change the dynamic of how you play. Even when you're on my, I'm on my own, like I'm by myself usually when I go and record. When I go with friends, of course, it's different. But when I'm on my own, that's when I record. And and I feel, I won't say nervous, but you change. Something changes in you because the camera's on. I guess it just is what it is. I guess it's similar to this podcast, right? I'm pretty much myself on here, but I'm sure I play up to the camera to some extent. When you meet me in real life, maybe I'll be a little bit more reserved. I might have another, you know, tick that you haven't noticed. But there's something that you do once the camera gets turned on. And even more so, I'd imagine in the pack club, knowing full well that the management's recording it, knowing full well they want you to provide them with a good show so they can share it, knowing full well how clips are, you know, um, how people sort of respond to clips online, comments on YouTube, comments on Instagram, hate comments on Twitter. You know how social media is. All this will be playing in your head as you're playing. And it's probably not conducive to playing a good DJ set. And it's not conducive for the punters, the customers, for having a good night. I would imagine so. It's sort of equivalent, I would say, to like those really overcrowded and um, bro -y boys club um, DJ booths that you see at DC10, right? There is a side of it that, you know, some people would say, oh, the only reason why you're criticizing that kind of stuff is because you're not there yourself. Cool. I get it. Maybe. But there also is an aspect where you kind of feel gr weirdly uncomfortable because you know yourself having played how... Um, uncomfortable it is to have people just hovering around the DJ booth, especially if, the, you, if you don't know them. It's one of the worst feelings, right? Because usually it's a sign that you're meant to wrap up the night because it's the bar manager telling you to like, you know, wrap it up, last song. Sometimes it's also an indication that you're doing a terrible job and the manager checking in on you to make sure you're not high on crack. Or it's just really distracting to have somebody standing off, you know, in your eye, in your out of your line of sight, just staring at you or looking at your screen or something of what you're playing. It's one of the worst things. It's probably one of the, the most annoying things I've ever experienced in a DJ. It's one of my ultimate pet peeves, right? People coming over and just like, relax, chill out, right? Just dance, do whatever, but let me do my thing. Even if you think I'm playing terrible, like let me do my thing and then you can come and recover the night or do whatever you need to be done. So um, I feel uncomfortable watching people standing in DJ booths at DT10, watching other people play, let alone myself being in that position. Then I switch it to the customer's point of view. And I think to myself, part of the reason people actually go to clubs, I think, again, I don't know about kids. I don't know. I haven't spoken directly to children because I'm not Crystal Leah, but I would imagine a lot of the young kids at the moment now, when they see these clips on these... Um, uh, electronic music meme pages I'd call them or blogs right uh, these sort of like a drops banger um, you know arm to Dixon which is obviously mostly centered on inner vision but there's a few of these little um, Instagram pages right up around it right where people basically regurgitate the same you know 10 to 20 clips of DJs playing in places but I'm assuming a lot of it has, has to kind of be worked in with PR I'm assuming a lot of PR companies reach out to them send clips of DJs on their wrestlers or booking agents to help them get more gigs because we all know the story of, of Jada G right she mentions where she didn't really want to do deck mental because they record sets and she's really uncomfortable playing in front of people um she gets you know weirdly um sexist comments on YouTube because she's pr pretty much quite an attractive young lady I guess so you always receive like really nice complimentary messages and I'm also assuming you're going to receive some really toxic messages too because if there's anything I've learned 
learned about um YouTube, mate. Um the chin the, the chin strokers brigade on YouTube, they really have something they really have an Instagram when it comes to female DJs. Like those guys, I don't know what it is, whether or not they've been rejected by a bunch of girls in school or they generally think women can't DJ. They really have a visceral reaction when they see a woman on screen. So naturally Jada G was quite nervous about, you know, um doing a live stream for Deck Mantle. She eventually got persuaded to do it. Um, I think it was part of the boiler one. I think it might have been one of her first ones. The one where she's sort of like on a thumbnail, her hair's like going all over the place, right? And it's got, you know, m m the last time I checked, it maybe had a quarter million views. I'm not sure how many it has got now. And she says, I think in one interview, I forgot, I think I saw it, maybe electronicbeats.com. But I remember her saying that, oh, that, that um, set she did, even though she didn't want to do it, was the set that really propelled her career. It took her to the next level. Even though she's a great she's a great producer, great artist, um, a pretty pro a proficient DJ for somebody that plays the music that she does, playing on vinyl. Like she's really good. But still, that performance on Deck Mantle is what really took her to the next level. And I'm sure a lot of people, customers also, found out about Jada G specifically because they said, Oh, who's that mixture girl with a big curly hair playing, you know, at Dick Mantle. They listen to the set like, oh shit, she's not just like, you know, um, there for the show, there for the image. She's actually really good. And then boom, you dig into a story, da, 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 da. then you go and follow her on tour, you see her playing in the club somewhere. So I'm sure a lot of kids see clips on these um, internet, or these, sorry, these social media meme pages or whatever, and base a lot of their buying decisions on who they kind of resonate with. It's probably not the best thing to do, but it is similar to what I did. I only say best thing because I, I think, you know, having any sort of idea of what a DJ plays from a minute clip you see on Instagram probably isn't conducive, right? To having a great night. Don't get me wrong. And a lot of it has to, doesn't have to, a lot of it just not only in the DJ, it falls on where you're going to go see them, the club, the time of year it is, where you are at your stage of life. Loads of things kind of play a factor into you having a good time or not having a good time. But I remember when I was first getting into electronic music, part of the thing that I used to always do was that sometimes I'd like do this odd thing where I'd be like, especially back in the day when RA had a comments section still, easily one of its best features. And um, when I used to do the DJ polls early, um, the numbers between like 30 and downwards, 30 to 100, were really reflective of like the scene and what people kind of liked and who performed well in clubs. And you and you basically click on a random DJ, let's say Move D or something, and you click on his name and then... um you'd find a set he played in Croatia or something. Someone mentioned some other DJ in the comments and you go on their page and essentially you'd find these little clubs all around Europe, right? And what I'd do is I'd kind of, you know, put a very prominent DJ's name and I'd put the club onto YouTube, um, search it, uh, sort it via date added and you see all these videos that people upload. And this is prior to social media also, right? You see a lot of people adding videos, or uploading videos of uh, DJs playing at certain festivals or clubs and then asking for track IDs. That was big at that time, right? Or oh, track ID, da -da 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 -da. move D playing at this random rave somewhere in Romania. Track ID, please. And someone right, comment, da -da -da -da. and this is before Shazam was really prominent. So um, that was where I discovered a lot of DJs through that kind of thing. So you're kind of, it was sort of like what people are doing now with Instagram stories before they changed their, you know, settings. Before you could go on Instagram dis dis discovery tab, I think, whatever for a location. And you could basically check through people's stories and see what people are tagging in real time. So it gave you an idea of what the club looks like, who kind of goes there, the sound. It kind of just gave you a bit of a voyeuristic, you know, view on what was going on. Now they've taken away that feature, I think. Um, from what I understand, the reason why they did that, so people can engage more with stories, so they're not going on other people's stories, I don't know, blah, 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 who knows. Um, but I think a lot of people definitely find their favorite DJ via those Instagram um, electronic music blog pages, for sure. So... If you're an artist, you're in a bit of a you're bit in, you're a bit in, you're in like a conundrum, aren't you? Because on one side, recording your DJ set is definitely going to change the way you play. It's going to affect you some way, right? Whether you know it or not, it's definitely going to change how you play. It's going to affect the night, whatever it's going to be. But you also know this could really set you up in terms of securing some of your gigs, you know, for the next six months of the year, wherever it may be, right? Um, or it might completely, you know, it might put you in the in in front of certain people. It might kind of bring certain attention to you, allow you to maybe, you know, whatever it may be, the certain opportunities that you're gonna get via having that kind of, you know, um, virality of a clip go online somewhere. There is something in it, so it's a weird conundrum to be in. Um, again, I think from a purely customer point of view, knowing there's a camera staring in front of a DJ is gonna make you. I don't know if you'll even even notice if you're you know actually on it. You probably won't notice. You'll probably be spending too much time in the in the toilets of a club to notice anything's going on. But I don't know, man. Like I also think about Boiler Room, right? I think Boiler Room. The reason why Boiler Room was special at the time that it first sort of launched 
was that you got especially no no let's say let's say the second phase when it started to go into clubs and stuff and festivals it was good to because you got like a little peek into local scenes especially when they started to go to you know far-flung places in the middle east places in far east asia south america places in africa it gave you an idea of what was going on there because you never got to see if you weren't really curious and you weren't digging in you never got to see that kind of thing obviously then it got and kind of got bastardized and the, and the sponsorship jumped in and now it's just turned into basically one big branding or marketing exercise but at the time the spe the, the the goal that's on boiler room was that you got to see all these people that you could kind of I'd see yourself in like enjoying the music that you like, discovering tracks, seeing how people respond to stuff, what people are wearing. It was bloody amazing, right? And I think, again, a lot of that, um, a lot of, you know, Boiler Room probably shining a light on those local scenes allowed certain artists to basically propel their career to the next level. Um, so they probably owe a lot to that kind of platform. So it's a strange one, right? Again, because I'd imagine a booker, a, an agent, a manager would probably want you to record your set in a club because that means they're going to get more money because that means you're going to get more gigs, more inquiries, going to mean more dollars in their pocket. But for the artist, it's definitely going to cheapen, not cheapen, it's going to change how you approach the work. Let's say that, not cheapen. It's going to change how you approach the work. Um, like I said, because I've noticed it myself, recording DJ sets at home, even in studios and stuff like you put the camera on and it just changes you. it is what it is we can't help it i don't know what what, what it does to people but um let me know in the comments and what do you think will you be will you still watch dj streams once the clubs reopen um or will you do like most people because i've seen anywhere even the numbers of places like united we stream um uh, how you ever pronounce hall berlin radio that's gone down boiler room numbers are i don't know the lowest i've ever seen in my life but that might just be because people have kind of been put off of boiler room with all the kind of you know funding scandal thing they were involved in i'm not too sure but the numbers across the board look like they're a bit low and i don't see any people sharing as many clips as before people aren't really you know screaming from the rafters that they're playing somewhere and boasting about it i don't know I, i'm seeing the kind of the interest dwindle a little bit maybe it's streaming fatigue maybe it's just my bias because i'm not tuning into it so i'm not seeing it on my feed anymore and their algorithms changed i don't know i'm just a random guy in east london chatting shit so yeah let me know in the comments down below what you think of that one